Well, thanks. That's pretty. That's a pretty big call. So thank you so much. And I just want to thank Bob and Graham also for having me tonight. It's really a privilege and an honour to speak tonight. But what I don't want to do, I don't want to tell you too much about the business. What I really want to do is share with you what's really been important for our growth and why it's been so sustainable. Um, sort of share then, because we're a global company, which we'll touch on, we've got so much profit offshore now, and really share my observations of what we're seeing around the world from other countries and governments, and try to pull that together to come up with some, some really strong thoughts that are close to my heart about what we need to do in Australia. Ideas come from experience. So for me, the same thing was, was exactly that. I worked for one of the big um, accounting firms. Um, I traveled around the world with them at a very young age. And from that experience, I saw some great things because I used to travel. And at that time in the world, there was only four big players that could manage any travel account with any size, particularly that was, that was offshore. And, and there's things about that company that, 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 those, that typified travel that I really didn't like because I experienced it myself. They were three things. They, all the service was call centers. And I don't know about you, I still hate pressing one or two for this or that and, you know, voice recognition sort of things uh, when, when, you're in, when you really need a human being. Um, secondly, they, they didn't have technology that actually added value to anybody. Um, but then thirdly, there was no transparency about how to really drive savings. So as a young kid, a little brash, I guess at the time, I took, I took what was a big step when everyone said I was absolutely mad to do it. There was no money in travel. I left a great paying job to start it up. And the interesting thing about that <coughs> is that um, I actually left with two staff. I, I employed someone and that was it. And I got there and went, oh no, what do I do now? because um, it was a big thing ahead of us. But what I can say is that the things I want to share with you that have, that have been really good to me are two things. One is be really true to your competitive advantage and B, have a culture that you can leverage that can enhance that competitive advantage, which I'll talk to you a little bit about because that's a secret to our business. So those, those are the three things that we, that we left to start because that was what we thought was missing in the world. You needed really good personalised service to manage CEOs that were travelling a lot and changing and clearing wait lists and things weren't working for them around the world and what you could do. But we had to deliver really great technology that worked and we are going to make sure that we were accountable so that if someone was spending $5 million, let's show them how to spend $4 million. And at the time, no one was doing that. So it was taking accounting knowledge and applying it, but particularly taking technology to make the user experience easier. So we go on a few years. We go on to, you know, we're at, you know, 23 years or so now. The great thing about our business is that our value proposition is there. And this sort of sums it up. You know, if you look to the bottom left there, you'll see that 95% of our clients really value our technology. In fact, that's a large reason we're winning clients all around the world. Those bottom two ones are about our people. When you've got people that feel empowered in their role um, and 99% of them want to go the extra mile for clients, guess what? You have happy staff and happy clients because they're being serviced. And of course, the 97% the one at the bottom there are about strategic plans. It's all about our ability to deliver return on investment. Let's show people how we've got a plan to save them money. So the thing is that you, you move on in time and now we're, we're, we've got you know, over 2,200 staff we're operating with customers out of over you know, 70 cities now, or offices in 53 countries, and we've got sales of 4.2 billion. Um, but it's really happened very quickly. And what I want to touch on is that's what growth looks like. We've been lucky, we've had consecutive years of growth since we've started, um, and that's always a nice growth curve to look at, isn't it? But you can see a lot of things have happened since the IPO, and I want to touch on that. So for those that like statistics, as many people do, I, it, our business is really two phases. It's what we did leading up to an IPO, uh, which Morgan's of course managed for us and still manage with it, manages uh, today, and what happened afterwards. And I think it's really important to note. So we started with one million, one million dollars of sales. I think no, no big deal. We built our way up to 352 million, which is pretty incredible. But in six years, you can see that has just accelerated incredibly. As is the cost. I mean, running a business now, you know. You look at where it is today, it costs us one million every working day. And you know, you, I, I feel a real sense of responsibility for the staff we employ, because that's a big number that we've got, to, we've got to continue to nourish and grow. And of course, for, it's what, what we're most proud of in our business is that there's not many Australian companies that, have, that can actually go offshore and make it work. The majority of our profits now are offshore. We had nothing offshore six years ago, so 70% of our profit is now 
offshore and it's my observations of that and working with different governments and different environments and different cultures, I really want to share my observations. Of course, the staff numbers are pretty big and as we said before, for those that listed, um, it's been a pretty good ride. You know, that's just the capital appreciation, not to mention dividends. But you can see how the business has really grown very, very quickly. And with that in mind, I really want to, one second, sorry. I want to come to why we've expanded and the opportunity for all Australian companies. When we listed, you'll see those green dots in Australia. We had half of those when we listed and all the green dots now are where we are. And the most exciting thing to say about that is that Australia is such a small place. You'll see there the size of the markets. Australia is just $7 billion. When we listed, we were under 5% of the market. We're 14% and beyond. But look at the size of the other markets that we're in. And their problems that we experience are far greater offshore. Um, everything's cool centre. Technology really doesn't apply across borders. And no one's really thinking about driving savings for customers. So you can see that's exactly why we want to take things offshore. The opportunity is huge. The market is 1.4 trillion. The biggest player is a tad over 1% of that. It's the most highly diversified industry or fragmented industry, and that's the opportunity for us. You can see the size of the market. I can pretty much safely say that as of next year, we'd expect Australia to be the smallest of those markets. And that's notwithstanding the growth we're getting in Australia. So what does that mean? doesn't mean too much other than what I want to do is share with you a few secrets. People often ask us, how have you done what you've done with so much control? And I put it down to two things. One is to really understand our competitive advantage. And those things are we're really good at blending technology and service and delivering ROI, but also really enhancing a culture that can support that. And by that, I mean unlocking the value of a culture. So in our business, we empower staff to make decisions like you would when you're entrepreneurial. By definition, that means a number of things. That means they're curious. That means they're innovative. So we're building tools with our clients, for our clients. But more importantly, and most importantly, they're helping the rest of their peers by making life easier and, and driving um, mundane process out of the business to better service customers, but also find productivity. And productivity is, is very, very important to compete on a global scale. I think we all know that. So when you come down to things, it's my strong opinion that, the, that we are living in the most challenging times in my lifetime as a business person, but they're also opportunistic times. Um, technology and disruption is everywhere and everyone, absolutely everyone, is not immune to it. I'm a great believer that it's a generation's time, if you don't have emotional intuition, you'll be really worried about your job or as a company. That's, that's, the, that's the reality of life. So what we have right now, if you're a startup now and you're in the rest of the world, it's very, very easy to start a business, to take that opportunity to, because of technology and the internet, you can scale that very, very quickly. Um, you get access to global business like no other, but more importantly, it's borderless too you don't have to be Australian sitting in Australia anymore. And that's something we've really got to tackle very importantly. So my observations and beliefs on this are really strong um, because it served me really well. I strongly believe that countries that develop a long-term strategy and vision for the future, and by doing so, really best leverage their competitive advantage and unlock the cultural behaviours that best support progress, they will be the ones and the only ones that create sustainable wealth businesses and jobs for their people because global competition is real and I want to talk to you about that because it's it's scarier than people think. But before I get onto that, I want to share with you, I am a proud Australian, I love Australia, it's something I'm really passionate about because if we take our competitive advantages, it's a throwaway line, the lucky country, but we really are. I mean, compared to other countries we operate in, we are blessed with abundant natural resources, not just stuff in the ground, but also, of course, food bowls, um, you know, you name it. We've got a, a massive land of tourism, pristine um, produce and air and water. We're also a huge country that we've been lucky, haven't we? We've been isolated by oceans. We haven't had many real wars on our, on our shores, anything significant. Um, and at the same time, that's, that's been a bit of an issue because we've got a small population. But this is where culture comes into it because 
the great thing about Australia, you look at our, our land population, we're about the same size as America and Europe with, you know, 15 or 30 times less the population. But we bat above our weight, don't we? And no one's really identified why, but it's our culture. And I, I, want to, I want to pick out five things that really make Australia. And as I share these with you, just think about how these things are playing out today. The Australians, that old saying, have a go, you mug. Have a go. What does that really mean? It really means we're not afraid to have a crack, are we? We're glass half full. We're innovators. We're problem solvers. And it's a really hard thing to find everywhere else in the world. But this is a country where you can have a go. The other thing is everyone gets a fair go. And that's a really good thing because we're a compassionate bunch and we're known for that around the world. But most importantly, we're a place where you can voice your opinion and opinions are respected. And that's a really great, it's a rare thing in the rest of the world. Um, the other one, hard work is rewarded here. You know, the good thing about here, people get on with the job, don't they? We don't need stroking. We don't need a leg up. We just get on and do our business. And that's the old she'll be right as well. We're full of common sense. And it's a value, I can tell you, is really hard to find in the rest of the world. We're full of it here. Common sense, that is. Um, and we're not phased. We're really cool under pressure. People love employing Australians around the world because of that. But lastly and most importantly, what people love about us, we're larrikins, right? Seriously. Well, we don't take ourselves seriously, do we? In fact, I'd say we're politically incorrect and we're certainly not a precious bunch. And these are five features that, that really help us in, in business life. And I think it's grossly underestimated because these things define Australia. They define Australians in both the way we work, the way we operate and the way we innovate and compete. And, and as well, we've got those natural competitive advantages that, that in the past we've leveraged exceptionally well. But we are a victim of our own success. As we all know very well since World War II, we've had continuous wealth generation because of a lot of lucky advantages. We've always had either it's agriculture or mining or even more recent times property to, to bail us out. But the reality is now with 25 years, I think it is, of consecutive economic growth, what that really means, if you assume you leave school at 17 or 18, it means everyone under the age of 43 years has never ever experienced tough times, right? That's not one generation, that's two generations. So you, you, you think about that, where people think, oh, I don't have to go to work, it doesn't matter, I can move around. It, what the government spends, it doesn't matter because they just don't know the consequences. I do just remember, it didn't affect me at the time because I was just starting out, but I do remember when, you know, interest rates, mortgage rates were 17% when I was a kid. Okay, there was a 10 or 11% unemployment, there was 25% youth unemployment. You know, put that outlay across today's society and property and what would happen? It would be carnage out there. Um, and that, that's something important to note that I think we, we need to talk about, right? Um, but what has that done? It's bred gross, gross complacency. Um, we're asleep at the wheel. And what, for someone that loves Australia, it breaks my heart because it's not, it's not just government, it's, it's business, it's media, it's all of our, it's the whole population is asleep at the wheel. There is no sense of urgency. And, you know, government, media, industry need to lead that. Because what I want to share with you is what's happening in the rest of the world while, while we're doing this. Um, you know, as you said, we've got really big, really big headquarters in Hong Kong, London and the States. Um, and in those areas, I can tell you, there's a real sense of urgency like I've never seen because they've seen adversity. Most recently with the financial crisis, and you take London in particular, which is a great example, they've now got this thing called Brexit they've got to deal with, okay? It's a real shock that to, to the system. And over there, you feel it, you can smell it on the street. There's a real sense of urgency about getting things done. In every circumstance in those three regions, North America, Europe and Asia, they are doing really good things with corporate tax. You know, Hong Kong, Singapore are 16 and 15 per cent. UK, after the, after the, uh, the, the, the GFC, realised that manufacturing was no longer their gig and they invested heavily in being in, in a finance hub, but there was nothing left in finance. So they, again, through adversity, did what has worked for them, before the Brexit anyway, was dropped company tax from 30 per cent, now down a, on, on its track now to 17 per cent. And they had amazing GDP growth because surprisingly a lot of people went up and set up in London and the UK because there's, it, things are borderless now with technology. The US, US tax is 35%. We get up all state taxes. It's pretty expensive. Is it going to be 25, 15? Who knows? 
But what I can say about all those, all those regions, their investment in infrastructure, not just bridges and roads, but technology infrastructure, they are building a base to nurture future business. They want to be competitive. And, um, and there's some technology parks that it, it's, the mind boggles, particularly in Asia and China. They've got good long range vision. So let's look at Australia. What are we doing? This is what the competitors are doing. Got cheap tax, they're investing in infrastructure, um, and they're setting up nurseries to capture the best talent and the best companies in the world to sit up in their in their precincts. Well, what are we doing? I, I can. It saddens me actually. We are truly squandering the competitive advantage we have. You wouldn't believe it, could you, that we have all these natural resources and these projects and and you look what's happening in our, in our country. But more importantly, we're eroding our cultural values um, that create the success in the first place at an accelerating rate, without any debate, without any understanding of the long-term consequences on our social fabric, our society, but particularly the long-term wealth accumulation we're all accustomed to. And it is a really big problem. We need to act really quickly. And the reason we've got to act is because the industries of the past will not be the employers of the future. You know, I have friends that their, their, their parents and their parents' parents worked in the same company that was heavy manufacturing. It looks to me right now that mining isn't going to solve many of our problems moving forward um, in, in, this, in this lifetime anymore. And property can't just keep saving us. These industries, one day we're going we're gonna to fall over where one of these three things don't work for us. And they can't be relied for future growth. That's, that's the reality of the way the world's going. So what do we need to do? We need to inspire leaders to set up from scratch, to fill the void, to be the next people that can take an Australian business and take it globally in new industries and take it to the world because they will be the future employers. And with what's happening with automation and technology, we need future employers. People need jobs and they're going to need jobs moving forward. So I, I, from my observations, I want to propose five things. Uh, these are my personal views, not my company's views. I want to make that very clear, clear. But we need to do what I think are five things. And the first one is probably obvious. We need mature debate and good policy from leadership. And that's across the spectrum. That is not just sitting with the politicians. We've got politicians in the room, of course, but that's media and business leaders. Um, you know, we actually need to tackle issues with honesty and integrity. People have lost faith in our establishments. They have because no one delivers what they promise. They can't trust what people are saying. And then I want to take everything back to culture because it's a cultural issue in our country. You know, we need, to, we need the courage to call things as they are. Call a spade a spade. It's our way. It's our way. We need mature debate. You know, we give both sides of the debate a fair go. We need to. It's the Australian way. That's what we do. But there's some, some alarming observations that I can say that are, are very concerning. You know, take this country, you've got organisations, political groups, activists, call it what you will. They, they, they've got agendas and they're claiming to represent the interests of the broader community, but they're not. They're not balanced. They're often got their own personal crusade that's way above the interests of the broader community or the interests of, of the people involved in that community. I really, I really feel sorry for regional Australia right now. There's been over a dozen projects I can count now up to $100 billion that have been squashed because of lobby groups where if you speak in, in the regional Australia, every, all the communities want it because they want jobs because that's the area of, the, of Australia where there is gross unemployment. It's a really sad thing. It shouldn't occur. Um, the, the next thing is about debate. You know, these days it's, you know, it seems to be okay to ridicule or character assassinate someone for a view. Whether their view is right or wrong isn't really the point. It's un-Australian. Our way is to, is to listen to views and, and debate it and, and um, give a point of view and, and make, have a debate over it and have, a, have an alternative opinion rather than smashing people. Um, it really needs to be stopped because no debate does a number of things. And I tie it back to our company. We're, about, we're all about um, empowering people to think uh, and to be innovative. And when you stop that, you stop thought, you stop innovation. That's the most disastrous thing we could do for our country where we need to find new industries that are going to be the way forward. So I want to touch on things, and I first want to touch on, on our politicians. For those in the room, I, I know how difficult it is in this environment, but we need vision. We need your leadership. We certainly need certainty on the way forward. And most of all, we need execution. We certainly need bipartisan support of good policy, of good policy. It doesn't matter, Labor, Liberal, Green, whatever you want to call it. But what we don't want is policy hatched up for the consensus of the day. 
that's that's really important. And and next, we need to be results driven. So let's put out what we're going to do a vision, and let's be accountable for executing it. And most importantly, we need to be courageous. That's our way. Have a go. Have a crack. I'm convinced convinced that the broader community will support any party for a number of terms if they can be straight about what the issues are, talk about those issues um, and then articulate why we've got to do things and then get consensus and just do what the community wants, the greater community wants. You'll win the community over because that's what Australians are used to. That's what's been lost, our culture, mat matching and talking to our culture. And lastly, we've got to eliminate public waste. We're a small population with a big landmass, you know, and from where I sit, you know, we're from a can-do attitude to see white papers and committees and inquiries and studies and over-engineering and building up the public service to be greater and greater and greater. I appreciate it's, it's giving jobs, but it's not creating new revenue streams through tax that the jobs from the private sector would do. Um, and there's no lasting economic benefit from that. So we, we, need, we need to save every cent we can and push it in other areas I want to talk about. Next, the media, um, and, and particularly social media. I feel there's an opportunity, a real once in a lifetime or generational opportunity for the media to step up and have a powerful and positive impact on debate and supporting good policy. Because the reality is the media industries, if we know our companies here, they're already suffering from this, this radical change and disruption. We've seen great writers go out of business. They can't afford to keep all these media um, writers, which means that it's dumbing down. It's not their fault. And social media has created amazing deadlines that now there's more pressure on getting a story out than checking the facts. And, and, and that's, that's a real shame because I believe the media has a real opportunity in our culture to step up and reignite debate, give both sides a voice, you know, because they're the best position to identify facts from fiction. In fact, these days it's very hard to tell what is fact and fiction. There's so much propaganda being brought out and, and people just take it and deliver it up at the media to the people, so it's very hard. Um, you know, we'd love to see the media, when someone's calling for a personal crusade over what's in the interest of the community, call them out on it. Secondly, they need to support good public policy. Doesn't matter who it comes from and be ruthless on poor policy, ruthless, because that's the change we need. And lastly, to business leaders, including a lot of people in the room, we're also way too quiet on the subject. We should be supporting good public policy, irrespective of the government of the day. And we should be rejecting policy that adds no value to economic development. We should be talking about it in a lot more organised way, because we're just way too quiet and we sit back and watch the carnage. Secondly, our cost base. I travel the world and our cost base is expensive to operate and to give business a chance. You know, and when I say that, I'm talking construction, inputs, energy costs, tax. Okay? I'm not talking about salaries. Yeah, it's, it's a high, it's, people in this country are lucky they get a higher salary than some others, but that's not my, my bone because I think there's ways around that. But I really sense there's a risk for small businesses where risk rewards out of kilter. And I say that because Let's face it, let's just observe what's going on in this country. There's something wrong when a small business has to close on a Sunday or a public holiday because they can't afford triple time and pay the staff to make money. That's flawed when they're paying rent because they want to open up. My niece is 18, she works at a chemist on public holidays and gets paid $70 an hour. Good luck to her, but I, I, that's, that, that's a lot. That, something's just out of kilter there. There's something wrong in construction too. Now there's something wrong when a stop-go worker, because my friends are in construction, can be paid more than $100,000, yet, yet the reality is the people that make the biggest impact on our future generation, which is teachers, and the people that protect the community and, and add value to the community, nurses and police, in my opinion, those three groups are grossly undervalued, get paid around half of that for the responsibility they bear. Something's wrong. Okay? There's something wrong when, we, when we're blessed with the most abundant, cheap source of energy and variety of energy and we run out of power in one of our states. And more importantly, there's something wrong when power is going up 25% per annum for our community, for our people that vote for people. Something's wrong there. Um, and something's wrong when multi-billion dollar projects are shelved, not due to the economy, not due to, not, not, not due to anything that's commercial, but because there's activists that close them down and push them out and push them out. As I said, the last count I've seen, there's been 12 that all affect regional Australia, not the cities, 
not the cities at all, it's regional Australia, and they're over $100 billion. That is so material to GDP growth in our country. So something's wrong. So what we all need to do is, is face up to two really big realities. Yeah, we're an expensive place to operate. We are, and that's life, but that's okay because there's, there's a benefit to that. But what we've got to get our head around is the global world has no boundaries. So we talked about there's other countries offering these tax credits and, and tech hubs and things. It's highly competitive to grab business. What we don't want to see is great business going offshore from this country. So what do we need? Again, we need courage to tackle and debate to construction, tax, energy policy, penalty rates. We need a fair go for all because that's Australian. No other reason. That's the way we operate. Um, the, the third thing which is really close to my heart is infrastructure. If, if I had my way, I would nearly not spend anything in government and spend the whole lot in infrastructure because infrastructure is a safety valve. It allows us to gain productivity. I mean, we happen to be in Brisbane, and I hope some of you use the Brisbane tunnel system to come here tonight. What a great piece of infrastructure. That means a taxi driver might get three more trips than he ever could have hoped for in a day. We can courier goods around, move around, visit people, and even the community. It means you can spend, you've got more time to spend time with your family. These are great enduring benefits that only employ a lot of people to build, which is great for the, business, for, for the economy, but they leave a lasting enduring benefit on productivity. And it's productivity that offsets a, a, higher, a higher wage base. You, need, you can't have one without the other. And unfortunately, we haven't really got our head around that yet. Countries like Germany do it exceptionally well. Germany's another place where salaries are very high, but they're obsessed about automation to drive technology and change to, to offset those wage costs. And we need to do the same. And I'm not just talking about roads and bridges, I'm talking about soft infrastructure, technology as well. <laughs> it's really, really important because that, that's, it, it makes businesses more efficient and be able to do things that they could do onshore as opposed to having to live offshore in Silicon Valley and China and the like. Um, of course, infrastructure can't be pork barrelling infrastructure. It has to deliver an ROI. That's the most important thing, or then we're just wasting more money like we said before. So at the end of the day, we need productivity, we need infrastructure, it's gonna offset our, our, our cost base, and it's gonna give everyone a chance to have a go. My next point, my fourth point, um, is, is a, maybe a little controversial, but you know, we've got to stop the tall poppy syndrome. Um, we've got to acknowledge business because at the end of the day, right now when I pick up the papers, big business is a real dirty word in this country. It seems a crime. It's, in fact, it's nearly guilty to make money. Look at the banks, for example. Um, you know, by contrast, I spent a lot of time in North America. In North America, you're revered if you can start something and build it up. In fact, so much so you can even become a president when, you have, when you're a businessman. <laughs> But not that we want that to happen, but um, you know, the reality is, is that I, I can tell, I can, being, being from startup, it's a really hard thing to start a business. It's ballsy. You've got a lot of risk. Sometimes you usually start, you don't, even, you don't even earn a cent for the first two years. And more importantly, you've got a genuine responsibility for, employer, for employees that you, that you employ, for their well-being. You pay their taxes, they're super. And by, suing, by doing so, you hope, you hope to make a positive contribution, not only to their lives and their families, but the wider community in which you work. And, and that's what good business does. But to do that, there needs to be an obligation to be very ethical, act with integrity and honesty. And that's the only way the business is going to get any cred from the community. And that's got to happen a lot more often. But I do think things like this are great. We need to celebrate business and by doing so, inspire others to do the same thing. Because I'm telling you, we need new businesses in new streams to employ people in the future and take on the world. And my last point comes back, it sort of wraps it all up, I guess, is that we've just got to go back to what we know best. We've got to leverage our competitive advantage and protect our cultural advantages that support our long-term wealth creation. That's what's been a success at CTM, and really, quite frankly, business and government are pretty much the same things. Let's get back to our competitive advantages. Energy, we've got a lot of it, we know what to do with it. We're great with know-how. Healthcare, food, the food bowls, we, we could be the food bowl of the world. We're great at service industries. We're great with technology. We, our air is so clean, we're sitting on a tourism bowl that we could do a lot better at competing because we've got such great clean air and country and, and diversity, but we don't leverage it like other countries around us. You know, at the end of the day, we need a long-term vision that supports and underpins 
the hard by by hard and soft infrastructure to support these things. But most importantly, it's our culture. And I ask all of us to go back to everyone you know and start thinking about getting back to our cultural core because that's what's worked for us and that's the only thing that will save us in the future and let's keep our identity. Have a go, you mug. We have to stop being negative, destroying large projects and opportunities that, that really add value to communities and economic prosperity. We've got to stop bashing failure and acknowledging those that actually make it work and get it right with integrity. Um, we've got to bring back the passion. You can see I'm very passionate about this because passion's back in vogue. Sterile and political correctness should be out of vogue because no one listens. Secondly, everyone gets a fair go. It's again, it's a cultural thing. We've gone way too far the other way. Let's bring back honest, good debate. Call activists out that put personal cause before the good of the broader community. Okay, we need to encourage debate and challenge real facts. Come back to debate is the key point. So we've got an intelligent community that's, that's learning and becoming innovative. Also, we want to bring back hard work being rewarded and, and being identified for, for, you know, for, for, for talent. Let's reward talent. It's a fair go for everyone, but we want to make sure that if someone goes and takes a roof of the big project, whatever it might be, they're risky ventures that are going to help the community. Give them a leg up. Let them have a fair go as well, a fair, a fair playing field. And lastly, she'll be right. Common sense is our skill set, and that's what I see when I go around the world. It has gone out the window at every level of leadership. We need good policy. We need results-driven leadership in every sense through media, business and, of course, the government. And lastly, let's keep our larrikin status, what keeps us sensible. Um, political correctness has to stop. Let's start being courageous and doing what's right for our communities. Let's speak our mind, let, but also let's respect people's views and let's also be able to laugh at ourselves. It's the Australian way. We're not precious. You know, by being precious, we're sweating the small stuff and we're focusing on things that, quite frankly, are really not important to, compared to the big challenge we face in the world coming forward. So, the clock is ticking and what can we all do to help? I believe it's my opinion we all have the responsibility, all of us, to lift the standard in which we operate. We've got to leverage our competitive advantage and we must unlock and positively reinforce the be cultural behaviours and values that have served this country so well to best support continued wealth creation for all of Australia because we need it. Thank you.